welcome. Yes, welcome. Gwendolyn. Yes. So these are some of her paintings. Now, Gwendolyn has watched me on YouTube. So she's one of the many people, the thousands of people watch me on YouTube, did a little research and she goes, oh my God, he's only like six blocks away from me. And I have people from all over the world that call me up and I do coaching online. And they're like in Czechoslovakia and New Zealand, Australia. I put my phone number on the bottom of my thing. And so like thousands of people watch those videos and I, you know, like call me. And people go, are you crazy putting your personal phone number on? And so when people do call me, they go, oh my God, you answered the phone. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you think? They go, well, I just thought I was going to get an answering machine. But, um, but the thing is, you know, I found out that through the coaching and everything that I do is that most people won't call because they're not willing to make the effort to, to do that. The students like yourself that make the call are ready to get serious about painting. The rest of the people just basically just watch videos and think somehow in the world knowledge is going to drop on them and they're going to become masters. Truthfully, you have to have a mentor to be a painter. You really do. You don't hear a lot of great artists that have just been self-taught. You'll hear artists that are kind of self-taught somewhat, but they have a mentor, somebody that lives around them, somebody they're in communication with. Some people are lucky to have a mom or dad that are artists and they get them started. But if you sit at home and you watch YouTube videos and you think somehow this knowledge is going to just happen, it doesn't because you don't know what you don't know. Like when you came in today, you don't know what you don't know. And I said, oh, well, we've got to teach you what you don't know. And you go, well, I don't know what I don't know. And I said, well, I don't know either. So here, do this. Right? So this is, and the thing is, you're, whatever you were doing, all of you are probably going to look at her paintings and go, oh my God, she's amazing. I mean, for somebody who doesn't know what she doesn't know, you do know something that you didn't know you knew, but actually you did know. It's crazy. How did you know this stuff? Okay. She didn't know. She's just a natural. She's a plant. So anyway, so this is one of her paintings. You know? It is awesome. So I asked her a couple of questions and she told me kind of her process. And you know, when you don't know anything about painting, you kind of think, okay, well that's what painting is. You kind of put a picture down on, on a canvas. And like you said, you trace the, the, the photo on, which is a viable way. Um, some people use grids. And we haven't even started doing the drawing segment where we use the prospect, which is like the proportional divider is like, oh my God, when you find that out, you'll like, the whole world will open up for you. So this is like your first painting, uh, one of your first paintings. And it's like, it's really beautiful. It's a tracing, but the thing is it's a glorified photograph. And so you could almost justify it by saying if we, um, took this and went down to the copy center and blew it up onto this size in color. You could just kind of color it in like a paint by number practically. And so the issue is, is like, you know, is that really art? And for a lot of people it is. I mean, millions and millions of people watch those YouTube videos and they would do, be amazed that they could do something like this. But that, is that really art? And today you got kind of thrown into painting from something, from life, not from a photograph. And it's completely different, isn't it? I mean, I handed you some brushes today and I said, you're going to be learning what my phone students learn. When students call up for classes and once they make the commitment, I start teaching them. But before I start teaching them, I have to know what they don't know. And they don't know that they don't know that. And I don't know that what they don't know. So they have to do something they don't know to show me what they don't know so I can teach them what they should know, right? <laughs> but it's true, you know? So she's saying, help me. And I'm going, that's not fair because all the people that I coach online, they like go, okay, what's my first homework assignment? And I tell them, and then they go, 
how do I do that? And I go, I don't know, just do it. Because what, I mean, we have to start somewhere, right? So anyway, this is really beautiful. Um, my issue with it is very thin. And being oil painters, you want to paint with oils. The beautiful thing about oil painting is that it's luscious. And you know, after, after the 14th century, prior to that, all the paintings were just like this. They were just an outline of something and then filled in with color. So all of a sudden the artists, especially during the Renaissance and after that, the Baroque era and stuff, they started manipulating the paints and their ideas and stuff. And models started to drift off into space and have more than just a portrait of somebody. They actually floated and, and moved and movement and stuff and painted started to go. So you start looking at Rembrandt where paints applied thick and luscious. And they feel, find out if you start sculpting paint if you start sculpting paint, it becomes even more spectacular. So there's some Rembrandts that look like they're a quarter inch off the canvas, and they're scraped in and pushed and pulled. And you saw Dee doing the same homework with, that you did, and she used this big trowel palette knife that she's known for, and she's like scooping paint on, and you're like rubbing it in, I'm like going, so the first thing I did was take away your turpentine and your oil and say, stop painting like a watercolorist. Because it's like you, you're kind of like painting so thin. So anyway, so there's one. I'll show you two more just so you get a little bit more background. Here's another painting. Now, here again, it's very beautiful, very beautiful. It's, it's a lot, yeah. And the thing is, people who paint like this, I mean, you know, like I said, millions of people would be happy. They'd go, why is she sitting in an art class? It's like, but the thing is, it's like, it's, it's a photograph. It's a, it's a kind of an enhanced photograph. A little bit more, so I see you stretching over there. So. But it's kind of an enhanced photograph. Um, very beautiful. But one of the things that you'll start learning from me is we don't paint things, we don't paint portraits. We don't paint animals, we don't paint uh, vases and cups, we don't paint things. So we don't paint people. Okay, and this is what a photograph is, is that usually we take a photograph of something and, it's, and it becomes about them and it's a portrait of them. What we do is we paint effects something that is bigger than the objects. And the objects themselves, just like with the horse painting, the object itself is, is a thing that light hits. The magic that we have to put into our paintings is light. It's not rendering the object, it's rendering the light because that's the thing that's immediate, that's the thing that catches people's attention, that's the that's a foundation of what I teach. And it's the reason why my coaching classes around the world, people call me up for that. And you're going to learn that. Well, how do you make light? How do you make shadow? So, I know, that's why you're here. So this is beautiful. I mean, you know, can you imagine if you painted like this and you had some volume of paint on there, so it wasn't like just like a rendering on a photograph, but imagine it just glowing, illuminating like a Rembrandt. You know? So you have to learn how to put that in. And then we'll have to teach you how to do some framing. So first thing, first thing, I didn't know what you're painting on. I was painting on a wood panel. On a wood panel? Is that like a, uh, is that gesso or what is that? Albert, amber scent? I just went to Home Depot and I told them to cut out gesso. With gesso. Did you watch my video on how to prime your canvas? No, I didn't watch that one unfortunately. You didn't watch how to do that? Because no. when you're at the hardware store and you have the, the, the guy cut your boards yes. like that, then you go over to the spray paint section and you look for the Rust-Oleum primer, auto primer. Comes in a spray can. Oh, that's so easy. Yeah, yeah, just so sucks. And then I have these people that are like, well, that's not very traditional. And I'm like going, so you use gesso? And they go, yeah, that's traditional. I go, no, it's not. The, the gesso you buy now is latex paint. 
Latex paint isn't very traditional. It's like 1930s and 40s. It's plastic. Oh, so I put gesso, then sand it, then gesso, and mm -hmm. sand it. Did you buy the gesso in the can? Yes. Yeah, see, that's just latex paint. So you might as well just use a spray primer. I mean, you know, if you're going to go that way. Now, there is, there is, you have to make your own gesso if you want your own gesso. And you use marble dust, which is ground rock. And you add um, white to it, uh, uh, white carbonate paint pigment, and rabbit skin glue. And you put that on. And when you sand it, it's a completely, it's like alabaster. It's absolutely wonderful. But most people don't want to go through that thing. So you might as well just spray with gesso. The, the auto primer is amazing. It's amazing. Here's the third one. So here's the third one. And you can see this is really quite beautiful too. And this one, notice from the last one, look at the lighting that's on here. This painting has a little more magic to it. And we're not so kind of preoccupied with the figures themselves. The figures themselves here, these, it really is about them. You know, whatever, whatever is happening with them. And the reason why I'm going through these paintings like this is because my students kind of have to kind of get a refresher on, on art. It's kind of a little art history. But anyway, here's, here's a beautiful thing. So what we have here is we have the effect of light. Now you see the painting has a little more magic to it. We have a little bit of that effect happening with this smoke. That's fumatsu. It's like trying to grab a hold of smoke. It's like you know, the beautiful fumatsu. This is a much better painting. The problem is we get really kind of boggled down with the techniques more that we don't really enjoy the painting process, although the end result is really quite stunning. These frames got to go. If you want to collect, if you want to show somebody that you're serious about your painting, even at your, or at your stage, you need to kind of consider that putting a frame in something, something in a frame like this um, really kind of deflates your effort. I mean, if you're kind of on the verge of looking like a photograph, kind of print kind of thing, and you stick it in an inexpensive frame like this, immediately shots down. You know, so you can, you can immediately, and a lot of people ask me, how do you actually start selling your work? Well, first thing you have to do is you have to start presenting your work as if you're serious about selling it. And then I have people go, oh, you want $2 a square inch? And I go, yeah. And they go, well, I'll never be able to get that. And I go, well, first thing with that attitude, you're not going to be able to. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Second. Yeah. Second. <laughs> yeah. But second, second, the thing is if you want to elevate your, your price uh, in your frame so that you go to a higher clientele, you know, because this kind of frame attracts the Walmart crowd, okay? I know, it's tax. But the thing is, you know, somebody who, who's wealthy who could afford your painting, they're going to look at a frame like this and they're going to go, that's not going to match my stickly furniture. Right? Unfortunately, they're buying furnishings and stuff. There are very, very few art collectors. Do you know of anybody who goes to Carmel and buys paintings every weekend? Their house is filled with gorgeous pieces. Like, I know, in my entire life, I have, I have only come across one art collector. No, two, two. But one guy that stuck in my head. And he lived in a tenderloin in San Francisco, which is kind of the poor area where all the beggars are. And he lived there because he could have buy art and not put all of his money into rent. And when he went into his house, his house was floor to ceiling paintings of the most unbelievable kind. I mean, we're talking about Monet's and Renoir's and stuff. He, he discovered paintings that were unsigned in basements and stuff and then had them authenticated. You'd open up his closets and they were stacked with paintings. I mean, he was like a painting hoarder, but he was a true collector. He bought paintings because he just had to have paintings. And I, there are a couple of other collectors that are like that. Their walls are just filled with them. But most people come across a painting and they go, that would look good over the couch, you know? 
So if you have a frame that really looks like a piece of furniture, they can visualize that in their living room. And that immediately attracts a higher, higher grade people that could afford your paintings. So anyway, so, so this is a homework assignment that I have students do when they call me up. So they'll call me up, they'll call the number off the videotape, and they'll sit and they'll go, I want to take lessons from you. I'll go, OK. We find a place where it would work, and then I say, this is your first homework assignment. And what I want you to do is take a sheet, um, put a glass there with water in it, put a light on it, and then paint it. And they go, well, how do I do that? And I go, I don't know. You do it, and then we'll find out. Because they ask, how do I do that? I don't know how they were going to do that. They, you know, they didn't ask how I was going to do it. How would you do that? They said, how do I do that? And I go, I don't know. Do it first. So she did. She did it first. And so then what I can see is what you don't know and what you do know. Now, one thing I can tell from here is that you're not necessarily stuck putting paint on very thinly trying to cover a canvas. You actually know how to put paint on the canvas. So there is a painter inside of you. We just have to set her free. And so you did a really nice job. So where's your central focal point? Well, it's the center focal point primarily because it's the brightest thing in the painting. And also, when you put the light on it, I, I said, we're going to move the lighting around until something happens that's more interesting than the glass because we don't paint things. And a glass of water is a thing. So this particular glass of water is boring to look at. If I told you, here, just paint this, you go, why would I paint that? Well, yeah, it's boring. But it's boring until you get some light on it. And then when you get some, look at how exciting. Look at all the bubbles and stuff. You know, look at the lighting effects that cause on the, on the wood there. Look at that. Whoa. So we paint the effect of light on things. That's when it becomes magic. So all of a sudden, this becomes more magical. OK. And it's a center focal point. Give me another thing. You watch my videos. Give me another thing that causes a center focal point. Yeah, what, what is it? A center focal point has a lot of different things. One, it's usually within the middle third of the painting. But the center focal point is usually opposite the direction of the light. So if the light comes from the left, you want the center focal point on the right. Are you watching all this? Because this is for you, too. This is, a lot of students are getting a refresher here, but you two are like, on the hot seat here. So next week, you have homework to do. OK, so, so the light comes from the left, but the center focal point's on the right. Now, it's going to be the opposite direction if the light's coming from that way. It's also the, the brightest area of the painting. It also has the sharpest edges. So you can see this is where all the sharp edges, all these edges in here should be softened up. So you watch those guys on YouTube video, and they go, you want to have a warm blue and a cold blue. Don't you hear those people? Yes. She watches a lot of videos. It's OK. It's OK. I know. You still might not. I don't know. <laughs> it works out really well. You know, why, you know why it works out really well for her? Is that she paints what she sees, which is really the role. But the problem is, is most people don't know what it is they're looking at. And so I will ask somebody, is, is that a warm or a cool? at a dark value, they don't know. They don't know. But the thing is, they can copy it verbatim. I'll sit there and go, well, you painted it that way. And they go, yeah, I did. And I go, well, why? If it goes against your belief. So the thing is, you do it really well because you copy it. But, yeah. but the, the thing is, though, is that after teaching for 30 years, I didn't know either. And so I have students like Judy who have been in my classes for what's, 40 years she was born. since she was born. Her and I almost, she's, she's one of my oldest students. But then I have like Isabel. She's been in my classes for almost as long, many, many years. How many? 20. 20 years, yeah. So, so, you know, the thing is, for the longest time, I didn't know a lot of stuff until I learned that one secret. And that's why I mean you don't know what you don't know until now you start to get to know what you're actually looking at. And once you do, didn't it make a difference? I was, doing it, I was doing these talks, and I was having the students go and do homework assignments. They were my little, my little mice, doing little experiments with it. Because I would try that. 
And for some of my students who were there 10 years ago, like Lavon, you remember those days when we were at the flower place there. So Dee decided she was going to come in and do that too. So Dee is good at putting paint on the canvas. But you could see, for you being such a colorist and stuff, you kind of went into monochromatic. And that's a common mistake that a lot of people who do this homework assignment do, is that they think everything's white and the cup's going to be there, the cup's going to be black or gray. It's a, it takes a while to actually see the color. And then we, even when you started off, you started off kind of in grays and stuff. And then you started seeing the color. And you have to kind of start training your eye. So you could have gotten in more visual. But you were far away from the subject matter. You were putting paint on the canvas. But you weren't seeing the colors that were actually there in the shadows. So consequently, we almost have cool shadows on here. And we have cooler highlights. It gives us a little different feeling of, of the effect. And the thing is, what we go through life is that we go through life as if we're traveling 35 miles an hour and we glance at things. You know, we're too busy looking at things. And if you're looking at your subject matter and you're not studying it, you're not seeing it. And you have to stop and see and look and learn. Most people have problems doing the homework assignments do it because they, they're not looking at their subject matter. They're not seeing the shadows. They're not seeing the temperatures. They're not seeing the highlights. So Dee kind of, she's a very bursting painter. She works a lot from in, in, um, instinct. And she gets a lot of beautiful color. And she interprets color beautifully. But when you take that color away from her, and you have her look at something that's a lot plainer, a lot simpler. She bursts, but not quite with enough of that foundation in there. And so you get like a, something that's monochromatic. There's nothing wrong with it. But you don't see all of those little nuances. And I tell students, the first thing I do with students is to start training their brain. Start training to see what it is that they see. I have one guy who just started two weeks ago from New York. His name's Anthony. He just started, and the thing is, he's, he's, he's got a personality like crazy, you know, just with the whole Brooklyn accent and the whole bit. He's just like out there. And so, of course, he's going to do this better than anyone else. So he's got a really complicated, he took the, 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 the material and he's wrapped it and did a big knot, you know, in front of the glass and all this stuff, right? And, he, you know, he sends me throughout the week, he's texting me, what do you think about this? I'm like going, oh, keep working. So he didn't get any more help than you did. And I saw that material starting to get simpler and simpler soon until it was all gone. It was just like a line. It was just like a table in there. <laughs> that was hard. And I go, yeah, it is hard. But anyway. And I hardly ever, I hate wearing glasses. But the thing is, I can't see anymore in front of my computer. And you know, so I've got like, you know, every time I go to the dollar store, I buy a couple of them. Because you can never have too many, right? You're in front of the phone. You've got to like a, so I, my, the homework assignment was to gather them all up and put them in a big pile. Now, why did I have you do that? Is because you have some interesting possibilities for lighting effects. But it's an interesting design. You know, you've, everybody knows what they are. And you put them together, you've got a lot of shapes and sticks and twigs and stuff like that. So it's kind of interesting to see how we do that. Now, remember, we don't paint things. We paint effects. So the last thing I want to see is a painting of eyeglasses. I want to see effects of light. I want to see good design. I want to see, you know, the eyeglasses are just there for things to happen to. So one odd, bizarre thing, though, is that when you bring light straight onto something, it's not natural. You know, when you wear those, those headlights and you walk around, things don't look like they're supposed to. And when you're painting paintings that have a flash on them, and you're looking at an object through a flash, it feels unnatural. You know, so when you're doing a portrait of a dog, or like you're doing right now, and it has a flash, it's not a good idea. You want light to come from the left or the right, never from above, and never from the, the front, and never from below. Some people do that from below, but it's odd. You know when you go camping and they hold a flashlight under your face? It's supposed to be scary. I just think it's kind of stupid. But anyway, it just, it, it's, it's supposed to change the face so you look like somebody else. Um, so I would like to have seen the light going from left to right, but you're trying to get the effect of light coming through the glasses. 
which is a little difficult to do when you have the object behind there. So it's kind of a little, yeah, you could have kind of given us a down thing and the glasses could have been on top of the book. And then you could have kind of did, you know, so you could have changed the view of it a bit instead of looking through the glasses. So what she said was that this was out of the wrong place because you want your center and focal point to be somewhere in the middle in here. So. Um, <coughs> Now remember, I, I give you suggestions and rules. You don't have to use them. No, you break them, but that's fine. You don't have to use them. In this particular instance, it actually worked out pretty well fine. Darla's is more abstract. You know, it's kind of, she's kind of working with you know, shapes and forms and light. And the thing is, if she did more of that, it'd be really abstract. You can see how that kind of could go. And that's what abstract is, is for us to look at something differently. Abstract isn't to, to sit and go, I want to paint with blue today. I just feel so blue. That's not abstract art. Um, but but uh, taking something and abstracting it, taking us away from what it is to show us something else, that's what abstraction is. You're showing us what sunglasses look like and how funny they are and how playful and wonderful and colorful they are. And so your message is really powerful. It's good. You like that? If you like to take your painting to the next level, regardless at whatever level you are, please feel free to contact me at 415-606-9074.